Let's stand, hold your Bibles, iPads, iPhones, I, I, Captain. <laughs> Say, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what the Bible says I can do. Today I'll be taught the Word of God, and I boldly confess my mind is alert, my heart is receptive, and I'll never be the same again. Never, never, never. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Um, I'm sure that at, at least some of you are wondering, what is he doing? <laughs> and I will explain, uh, because there are probably people here that are going, why is he wearing a hat? Well, I would tell you in all humor that I shaved my head, but you can see the little hair here. Not true. Okay, so, and for religious people, I know some of you are like, I had somebody come up, I wore uh, torn jeans one time, and they almost didn't listen to me, but after the sermon, they liked it. We're not a really religious church. <laughs> so, the hat, I, I, here's what happened. Okay, oh, yeah, you like that. The, this section over here is a little strange for those of you that... Yeah, okay, so, anyway... <laughs> I was scheduled. I was flying out of Fort Myers, Florida. Uh, I was supposed to fly out at 3:35 uh, yesterday afternoon, and I I got four million miles uh, with American Airlines. So I've been flying them since uh, I live next door to Fred Flintstone, and uh, and so uh, they kept delaying, kept delaying, and finally I got out of Fort Myers at 7:05. My connecting flight in Dallas was supposed to be at 8:59, and we were supposed to land at 8:39. And so I thought I still might make it because I'm an eternal optimist. <laughs> and uh, some people just call that stupid. But so anyway, I, I got off and I, I run to the gate where I'm supposed to catch the flight here, which would land at 953 in Oklahoma City. And uh, so anyway, I get to the gate and they pushed off early. They didn't even think about me with 4 million miles with them. And, and I, I really probably didn't represent you as, as your pastor as well as I would have liked. Uh, <laughs> And so, and so anyway, I, I, I got through it. I, I, I went and asked, you know, is there another flight? Yeah, but it's full. You're, so I said, put me on standby. Well, you're the first on standby. And I, so now all of a sudden I'm starting to praise Jesus because that's what we Christians do when it looks like good things are going to happen. And so I, uh, I, I got on that flight, boarded full. I'm supposed to be here at 1139, leaving at 1040 from Dallas. Uh, we're sitting at the gate. The Pilot comes on and says, "You know, we're not going to be serving any beverages. It's just going to be, uh, it's going to be pretty rough getting into Oklahoma City. We're hoping to beat the weather, and so we're flying. And we, he's, we're coming in for landing. As we're beginning our descent, and just moments later, he said, we 'We're not landing. Uh, 45 mile an hour wind shear. So he does a U-turn in the air and flies back to Dallas." We, we land at about uh, about that time. I don't know what time it would have been. It seemed like about probably midnight. And um, he uh, pulls up to the gate and gave us the wonderful information. This flight has been canceled. Now is the time to go praise the Lord. There's got to be something good here. Right? And so I uh, <laughs> sat there a minute and I went, I've, I've been trying all day to come home and be a pastor. So I got off the plane, and I thought, what do I do now? And I thought, well, I'll rent a car. And then I looked at the weather that you all saw here, and I thought, probably not good for a guy over 40 to be driving in this kind of weather. <laughs> so I thought, well, I get a hotel room. So I get a hotel room, 1.30, I go to bed. I get an email right before I go to sleep. We got you booked on a 6.49 a.m. flight, arriving Oklahoma City, 7.47. Oh, I praise the Lord again. So I set the alarm for 5 o'clock, got a grand total of three and a half hours sleep, and uh, gleefully walked toward the American Airline counter, <laughs> looking forward to getting my 6.49 a.m. ticket. And I walk up to the counter, and you can tell all the agents aren't happy either. And I said, you know, I'm on the 6.49, I can't find you, get the record locator. I had everything. And uh, she said, oh... No wonder you can't get it at the kiosk. That flight's been canceled. Well, praise the Lord again. Said, so what, what's next? Well, well, 10. No, can't get you on that one. Sorry, Mr. Crow, you can't get home until later tonight. And I went, watch me. I grew up in Berry Hill. 
Matter of fact, I was one of those guys you're going to read about in USA Today. I was going to find a plane and fly it myself. So I thought, well, what do I do? I'm supposed to preach this morning. So I chased down a rental car bus, literally waving, looking like planes, trains, and automobiles. In this case, it was planes, buses, and automobiles. Caught the bus driver, said, I need you to take me to the rental car place. Took me to the rental car place. How many of you know when you're in crisis and you're renting a car, the prices go up? They saw me coming. So I got a car, got on the road about 6.05, made it here at 8.45. You do the math. I broke the law. But I think I did it with the approval of God. (laughs) I wasn't just having fun. I did it to get here to see you. And here I am. I did have a shower so you can hug me in the lobby afterwards. It is Father's Day. But if you saw what was under this hat, you would either get saved or leave the building. (laughs) So I'm preaching with a hat. It's a long explanation, but I enjoyed it. Okay, thank you. I just thought, devil, I am, I'm preaching to my people today. I called Pastor Jesse at midnight just to wake him up. I did. Hello. I said, you awake? Hello. How many of you know misery loves company? If I'm up, you're going to be up. I started to call everybody in my directory. Hi, it's Mark. How you doing? Early happy Father's Day. I said, Jess, be ready. You might be preaching tomorrow. I can't figure out how I'm going to get home. They did tell me they had some boats for rent. (laughs) So, I'm here. I've had very little sleep. I am not responsible for anything I will say today. (laughs) So, just hold on. Today, we're going to talk about figuring out fatherhood. You know, all kinds of books out there. And, um, you know, every one of them is filled with small lies. I mean, matter of fact, every father who's written a book about how to be a father at least partially sucks. There's not one perfect father on this planet. Now, I was thinking through this. Why is Mother's Day so much cooler and more popular than Father's Day? I'm trying to figure this out. I have an angle. I have a reason, okay, because I really think it stinks that fathers are, you know, and I'm going, well, why is that? Well, all y'all have to do, all you have to do is kind of be like Mary. Be done unto me, Lord, according to your will. We have to be like the creator of heaven and earth. Father, you get it? Heavenly Father, earthly Father. Nobody's ever quit serving Jesus because you weren't enough like Mary. (laughs) They quit serving Jesus because they look and say, well, if the heavenly Father is anything like you, really? You try carrying that load. Well, I'm trying my best. But I have not created anything, nor have I said, let there be light. Matter of fact, I can't even turn a light switch half the time and it comes on. And so we have to be compared to that. Are you a good father? And, and so it's very difficult this particular day for many people, specifically men, who have done their best to try to raise children and to keep them out of trouble. It's a difficult task. And so I just thought I'd give you 10 things that you'll never hear from a man or uh, it, and you'll get this. Number one is, you'll never hear from a man, well, how about that? I'm lost. Looks like we'll have to stop and ask for directions. <laughs> it's something you'll never hear a man say. Uh, next, you'll never hear a man say, you know, Pumpkin, now that you're 13, you're ready for unchaperoned car dates. Won't that be fun? <laughs> Said no dad ever. Number eight, I noticed that all your friends have a certain up yours attitude. I like that. Why don't you do two? Here's a credit card, the keys to my new car. Go crazy. What do you mean you want to play football? Figure skating not good enough for you, son? I'm sure I'm going to get in trouble for that one. Your mother and I are going away for the weekend. You might want to consider throwing a party. (laughs) Said no dad ever. 
well, I don't know what's wrong with your car. Probably one of those doohickey thingies, you know, that makes it run or something. Just have it towed to the mechanic and pay whatever he asks. <sighs> no son of mine is going to live under this roof without an earring. Now quit your belly aching and let's go to the mall. <laughs> 20 years ago, my dad, or 40 years ago, would have said, let me see that. Come here, son, let me check that out. Pow! Okay, so... I'll get in trouble for that one, too. Uh, next, uh, no dad ever said, what do, you, what do you want to go and get a job for? I have plenty of money for you to spend. <laughs> Just a few thoughts for Father's Day. It's a tough day for a lot of dads because dads are usually pretty tough. As a matter of fact, men's way of showing affection is chest bump. You never see women doing that. It's men. It's like, yeah, hey, son, come here. Let's hurt each other. I love you. <laughs> We're different. We're strange. We're hunters, gatherers. Women are nurturers and lovers, and fathers are historically, innately. We, we are those guys that really have not always seen the value in any type of intimate conversation very rarely do you ever hear a man ask anybody, much less his wife, tell me, honey, how do you feel? And most of you women are going, I've never been asked that question. Right on. <laughs> now, they'll tell you what, what do you, they'll ask you f infrequently, hey, what do you think? They really don't want to know, but they want to make you think they want to know. What do you think? We're men. We get lost. We don't ask for directions. We would rather die and end up in Nebraska en route to New Mexico. <laughs> Being a father is difficult. One of the hardest jobs, no, not one of, the hardest job I've ever had in my life. And there will never be a more difficult job than that one. So, let's go back and see what the Scripture says, because now I'm wearing a hat, and some of y'all think, if he doesn't mention Scripture, I'm out of here. So, let me read a verse for you. And you'll be able to tolerate the hat. <laughs> Out of the Message Bible, children, do what your parents tell you. This is only right. Honor your father and mother is the first commandment that has a promise attached to it. Namely, so you will live well and have a long life. These are words to listen to carefully if you are a, a, a young person under authority. This is critical for you. And it says, uh, fathers... Do not exasperate your children. So here comes the other side of this. By coming down hard on them, take them by the hand and lead them in the way of the master. So you can see that there are two sides to the relationship, fathers and children. It's not just the children. Now, I was a youth pastor for many years, which meant I was also a youth advocate I, had, I was an adult, but I was dealing with young people. I saw the parental side because I was a parent, and yet I saw the youth side. And the one thing that always disturbed me as a youth pastor was that I uh, would see parents uh, on an inconsistent basis, but when they were having trouble, I had a 1,000 kids in my youth group, so it, it wasn't unusual for me to have meetings with parents on a regular basis. And they would come to me, and some of them would say, my, my, my child's acting up. They're doing this and that. And I wanted to look at them and say, you know, I'm no authority on being a father or raising children, but it sounds like to me they're acting like teenagers. Because every parent thinks their kid is just off the track. You know what I'm saying? That, that my kid is crazy. Every 16-year-old is crazy. Some of them just act out. They're just 16. They've got testosterone. When you get to heaven, ask God why he gave them so much. Because that's the issue here. So they would come to me and they'd say, you know what? They don't respect me. I'd look at them and I'd ask this question. Probably shouldn't have, but I did. What are you doing to earn their respect? Their response to me was, well, I don't have to do anything. I said, that's where we'll disagree. You can mandate obedience, but you cannot require respect. Respect is something you earn by acting the way you should act. 
apologizing when you should apologize, responding in the right way when you should respond. We expect children to be robots, and let me tell you, I'm not saying this because I did everything right. Much of what I'll say today is because I did a lot of things wrong. And I'm looking back going, what would I have done differently? About 90% of what I did, I would have done differently. Because I look back and I go, I didn't know how to raise children. I grew up in a home where my father was gone 16 hours a day the first 14 years of my life. I, I didn't really have a father. That all I knew was I knew, learned how to work hard because he worked hard. And I watched, I emulated that, but I didn't know how to have a relationship. And this is where America is dying because we have a standoff now between adult children and adult fathers. We have a standoff. You weren't there when I was growing up. You weren't for me. You weren't there for me. And I'm going to get to this. So I, I used this week, I decided to do something radically different because I have five of my own biological children or my own children that I raised. Now I have nine total children. And, but the ones I'm looking at today, I'm going, now I raised five of them. One of them's in Seattle, one's in Miami, one's in L.A., one's in Korea, and one is here. He plays the keyboards on Sunday. You, we don't look alike because he has long hair. And I have none. So, I'm thinking to myself, and this is what happens. Dads, every Father's Day, if you have children that are grown and live elsewhere, the question for the whole week leading up to Father's Day is, am I going to hear from my children? Now, if you don't have children out of the house yet, you don't know what I'm talking about. The children at home, it's real easy. They live there. Mothers always whisper in their ears, don't forget to tell your dad happy Father's Day. Dads, you are drinking the Kool-Aid if you think they did it on their own. Thank God for mothers. <laughs> hey, don't forget to wish your dad. Hey, hey, let's go to the store and get him this. Now, I know some kids are really awesome, and some of you mothers are going, I didn't prompt him. He did it on his own. He's awesome. Okay, great. Some of you do that. But most of the time, it's the mother saying, don't forget, it's Father's Day. First off, why do mothers get to have their day in May when school's still in session and we get ours during vacation? Kids are sleeping in. They don't care about anything. They're not on a routine. They forget we exist, and they wouldn't be here without us. Thank you. One day I go and praise the Lord. Here's my son's number. Call him and remind him. Okay, so, so here's, here's the deal. So this, this year I decided, okay, I'm going to do something different. Starting early last week, I decided I'm going to post uh, uh, one a day of all of my kids, and then one combined. I thought, I'm going to post something about them, not to get their response, but I felt like that's what God did. <laughs> he didn't yell from heaven, y'all, oh, baby, shut up down there and respect me. Adam and Eve done went and messed up, and y'all are following down that pathway. Now, get it right. God didn't do that. But that's what we do all the time as earthly fathers is we expect something from our children. And what God says, let me show you, you can expect something from me. I'm going to show you how to be a dad. And I'm going to send my only son to die on the cross for you. And so what we often do is we start putting this off on our kids. Well, they ought to do this, they ought to do that. And, they ought to, and we act like the older they get, the less we ought to do. So I thought, I'm going to do something this, this time because I felt like God saying, this is what you need to be doing. It's called reciprocity. It's called sowing and reaping, that whatever you sow, you will reap. So I posted something about each one of them that was very true from my perspective. You can go to Instagram, you can go to Facebook, and if you're not following, shame on you. Did I say that out loud? You should see the post because I, want I wanted my kids to know how much I love them publicly I wanted them to know what I thought about them, and I wanted, to know, I wanted them to know what, what I appreciated about them. Now, this may sound bizarre to some of you because you think that because you're a parent, your kid ought to automatically come to you, and, and I'm not saying they shouldn't, and it's not right, but the reality is figuring out fatherhood is difficult because we get a certain age, and we start expecting things from other people that we should be doing ourselves. When's the last time you appreciated your kid? Well, you know, I feed them. Good for you. Aren't you a hero? I send them to school. They've got a great bedroom. How many of you know a kid doesn't have a clue what that means? First off, they have no idea what it costs to do that. And then when you start trying to tell them, they go, oh, you owe it to me. 
It wasn't my idea to be born. I wasn't up in heaven going, I'll pick them. <laughs> I mean, think about it. It's not their fault that they're here. And yet, we put all this off on them. Now, granted, I love my kids texting me, calling me, and all that. But here's the reality. And this is what came to me. I learned a lot after my dad, like I said, didn't, wasn't born again for the first 14 years of my life. I rarely saw him work 16 hours a day. And I remember I played all the sports. I was really good in basketball, probably held a record for most points scored in junior high before a three-point line, seventh grade, 22 points. That's a lot of points. Now, you'd think NBA now and all that, but, but no three-point line. And most of my shots were three-point shots. My dad never saw it. Played shortstop, baseball, played quarterback in football, played all the sports, junior high, going up. And, and my dad never saw anything. And so as I got older, I realized I was void of my father's, what I felt to be my father's love for me and appreciation. What I didn't know at the time was that everything he was doing was to provide for me. But I didn't understand the value of money. So therefore, if you don't understand something, guess what? You don't appreciate it. So you try to tell your kid how hard you work and what it took to make the money you make. You can do all of that, but they're not going to get it. What they're going to get is if you love them, obviously, and you care for them, and you spend time with them, that's what they're going to remember. And so when I, got tw- when I became 28 years old, one morning I collapsed. I was working three in the morning because I did learn this from my dad. I learned how to work hard. At three in the morning, I, I get up at three in the morning, go to UPS. I would throw boxes. And let me tell you, I know why a lot of your stuff is broken. <laughs> you have guys like me getting up at three, working five hours, going to college all day, coming home to study and being married and then doing it again. And so I didn't really care if your lamp, if it said fragile. Number one, if you ever take anything anywhere, never put fragile on the box. It's a temptation. I wonder if it really will break. Put sturdy, throw it. They won't do it. And so I would, I, at 28, I collapsed between coming home from work, going to college, collapsed in my bathroom, fell to my floor with a heart issue, ended up in the emergency room. They do the test, and they say you have a valve opening in your heart when it's not supposed to be. Oh, they're going through all this list of things, and they said you're doing something that you have to stop. They didn't give me any indication, so I immediately went to one of my professors. I was a psych minor and a theology major, so I go to the psychology professor. She starts asking me questions. How many of you have ever been asked questions by a, a, a psychologist? There you go. So she's asking me. They have this gift. They have an anointing. And, and so immediately I realized, she said, why are you doing everything you're doing? And immediately I said, because of my dad. And my dad had no clue. And I broke down in that moment, and I realized I was expecting from my dad something I should have been giving to my dad. I wanted his approval, and I had not given him mine. And so I I immediately knew God spoke to my heart, and he said, I want you to start giving your dad everything you want from your dad. And you know what that was? Growing up, my dad, it wasn't that he didn't love me. I never heard the words, I love you, that I could recall. 20-some years, never heard those words. Missed all of my sporting events, all of my games, missed most of my life. And I realized I wanted something I was never going to get seeking it the way I was seeking it. So I left that office, and I, I made, immediately made changes. And the next time I went over to my dad's house, he lived in Tulsa. I was living in Tulsa. I went over, and I, when he came out of the house to greet me, just they were on the porch, and they were always sitting on the porch. And I went up to him. I grabbed him, I hugged him, he froze like that pole right there. <laughs> Grew up in a family of 12 and, and had no idea what this, and I whispered in his ear, I said, Dad, I love you. Hardest words I'd ever spoken to my dad in my life because I had never heard him. From that time until the day my dad died in October of 2015, he and I were close because I did something that I wanted him to do, and it changed his life. When you give what you want, it changes everything. And you can say, well, it wasn't your responsibility. Love is everybody's responsibility. Love has no age limit. 
And so we are called to love. And so fathers get this. Number one, I use the acronym FATHER. First one is F, is forgive daily. You have to forgive daily. If you want good relationships, it's imperative that you walk in forgiveness. Remember the story of King David? Who, before he was King David, he was little David out on the backside of nowhere. You remember that story? And he was watching his, his dad's sheep, and, and, and they're, you know, I killed the lion, I killed the bear before he fights Goliath. This little David was the last of Jesse's kids here, and, and Samuel comes to anoint the king because uh, God told him to go to the house of Jesse. So he goes to the house, and he goes down the line of all of David's brothers. And Samuel goes, not him, not him, not him, not him. Jesse never offered up and said, I have another son. He's not here until Samuel said, is there another? Now think about this just for one minute. Samuel has to ask about David. Is there another? Not any of his other brothers. They're all there. I'm wanting to go, is David the only one working here? Everybody else is at the house taking a break. David's out fighting bears and lions. And, and, and so now you say, well, what's have to do with anything? Well, Samuel says, do you have another? So, well, yeah, he's out taking care of the flocks. And, and, and Samuel says, go get him. So now David comes in, and I'm sure the brothers found out and are not happy that David was overlooked. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm David and I'm becoming king, my dad's going to pay a little bit up in here. You didn't think I had it in me, did you? Huh? You thought this was just for big brother. Well, look now, daddy boy. I am king up in here. No, David had to do what I'm talking about. He had to forgive every day. He had to get up and realize my destiny is connected to my forgiveness. Listen to me. In a world that prizes intelligence and skill and talent, we've missed it. It's not your skill, your intelligence, and your talent, but it is your prowess to be able to walk in humility and forgive people. If you want to know what's blocking your destiny, ask yourself the question, do I have anything against anybody? I'm driving up here this morning, three hours sleep. I'm trying to stay awake. I'm on the road, and I'm praying, and I, this, this face comes to my, an <laughs> in, in image comes to me, and I knew, I thought, I immediately said, God, I forgive, I forgive, I forgive. Any of you have that problem? I mean, some of y'all do, like all of you. There's like that one person that really annoys you and you think you've forgiven them and, and you have, but it's not a one-time deal because every time this face comes up, almost I have to go, Ugh. And I said, I forgive, I forgive, I forgive. And then I realized, God, I, I, I know I, I don't feel like I've forgiven. So here's what I did. This is what you get with a theology degree. It was really great. I said, God, forgive me for not being able to forgive. <laughs> Isn't that cool? That just came to me this morning. It was profound. <laughs> I'm not sure how that works, but I felt a little better after I said it. Forgive me for not being able to forgive. Because I, I thought, how come every time I see this face in my mind, I have a hard time? I don't want to. Forgive me for having a hard time and not being able to forgive. So anyway, that just might help you when you're praying next time. Don't tell God I told you to do it, though. Okay, now, the A stands for ask purposefully. So many conversations that we have have no purpose. It's, how, how many of you know when we see certain people go, how you doing? How the kids? What's going on? Hey, hey. It's flippant. You never really gave any thought because you really didn't think how much you cared or do I really care. Ask some deep questions. My father passed away in October of 2014, actually, and I remember sitting in the den. My mother was already in a memory unit. This big house that he had built, it was just him, and, and it was just me. And I'm sitting there across the living room from him, and I'm, I'm, I don't know what to do because I, I'd never really had that verbal intimacy with my dad where I sat down and said, Dad, what was it like when you were growing up? You see, he came from a family of 12. He didn't get his first pair of shoes until he was five years old. So he was incredibly poor. So all my dad knew was I got to work hard. I got to make money for my kids because this will never happen to my kids. So he did all he could to respond to how he was brought up, not thinking that really money is not as important as relationships. 
He didn't know that. It wasn't that he intentionally did it. He just felt like this hurt me so deeply when I was a kid that, that I, I can't do this to my kids. As a result of that, we never had these conversations. So I'm finally sitting there and I asked him, I said, Dad, are you afraid to die? He was dying of pancreatic cancer. He only had months to live. And I began, I asked him that question. And now I look and I go, I would have loved to ask him, Dad, what was it like growing up and not getting your pair, first pair of shoes till you were five? What, what was it like? growing up in poverty like that what did you feel I also wanted to ask him because I I mean it's kind of hard to say because it, it, it's a little weird but I have, my, I have an older brother four years older than me and and uh so my mom and dad I think had in their mind what they thought was they wanted a boy and a girl which is what a lot of people want you, you know and you're poor so you think two is all we can handle so they, they they have my older brother and they thought for sure that I was going to be a girl. And I really did only get one quality that women have. I love to shop. So they did get a little partial out of that. But when I was born, there, you know, there, were no, there, there were no MRIs, CAT scans, sonograms, none of that. I mean, they actually chiseled the birth certificate on a rock. Kink, 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 Mark Crow, kink, 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 kink. Just kidding. And so I come out of the womb, and they're going, oh, it's another boy. Huh. So they had another brother, so I'm the middle child. And I promise you, all middle child will go to the front of the line when we're going to heaven. It's like all you firstborns out of the way. And you babies, you last ones that were born, you got treated like a baby. That poor middle child didn't mean anything. It was, oops, let's try to have a girl. Okay, I'm over it now. And that was not the image I was talking about, but now that that's brought up, it hurts a little bit. Okay, so... And I really wanted to ask my dad, what did you feel when I was born and you first saw me? Because I knew they had told me this story. We thought you were going to be a girl. They were real excited. I never, never really clicked until he was dead. That, what did you really think? <laughs> yeah, let me tell you something. Your kids have that moment. What did you really think? Ask purposefully don't just have lighthearted conversations if your dad's alive your children are young and they're still alive have conversations with purpose it's going to be difficult because your kids are going to say things you're not expecting they're going to feel what you don't feel uh, you, you may not be comfortable feeling i want to challenge you to start asking questions with purpose number three talk respectfully talk respectfully We live in a world where there is very little respect, but we need to start communicating. Disrespect begins with a thought about someone, becomes an attitude, evolves into a belief system, and then we treat people and talk to people the way we believe about them instead of talking respectfully regardless of what we think. We will all be done wrong. We will all have issues in life. Be sure that you talk respectfully. If anybody had the right to talk back to his parents, Jesus did. And you remember the story when he's 12 years old in the temple. They've been looking for him for days. And all Jesus said was, I had to be about my father's business. He could have said, I'm the son of God. Deal with it. I mean, you know what I'm saying? But he set the example of, I just want to tell you what I've been doing. Kids, your parents really, when they get upset, they just want to know, what were you thinking? <laughs> we care. The problem is sometimes we don't know how to care. It's difficult when you have an emotion of fear pops up and drives you to a passion. It's, it's scary. And we have to be ever aware that we need to talk respectfully. Number four, the H in father means hurt redemptively. Hurt redemptively. You will be hurt and you will hurt. My father hurt me, oftentimes didn't know he hurt me. I hurt my father, I'm sure, many times more than I will ever know I hurt him. And as a result of that, sometimes when someone hurts us, you heard the old saying, hurting people hurt people. 
That's called hurting punitively. So when your child hurts you, mom, dad, in this case, dad, don't respond punitively. You have authority. Yes, you do. But remember, you can demand obedience, but you have to earn respect. And so when you hurt, hurt in redemptive fashion. Don't be a dad that says, you know, I don't get hurt. Yeah, you do. You're a liar. (laughs) Men hurt. We just call it something different. And you probably never told your wife that hurt me. I can say it all day long now. I no longer have to say, you shouldn't do that. That really makes me mad. And we use other words like that really off me off. Mm. (laughs) Yeah, that's right, woman. When inside you're dying, it's like a little kid going, you hurt my feelings. I can't believe you said that. No, don't talk to me that way, woman. She'll talk to you however she wants to, and you know it. Quit acting like you're all that in a bag of chips. You may be the head, but she's the neck. That means whichever way she wants to turn you, she does. I'm the head. No, you're not. Yeah, you are. No. There have been a lot of talkers today. I had two people over here I almost made come up on the stage and finish the sermon. So y'all better be quiet. <laughs> Let me help you learn how to hurt redemptively. Number one, seek to understand. Don't seek to be right. Number two, ask for reconciliation. Number three, make your own emotional and mental adjustments. Quit asking everybody else to. Your adjustments should prevent a desire to get revenge. And you say, well, I would never do that intentionally. You're right. You wouldn't. Here's the problem. Most of our lives are lived by default, not by design. You respond to others the way you've been responded to your whole life. You react to others the way you reacted to your whole life. That's what happens. We get caught in this vicious cycle. It's called generational curse or generational sin. And we get caught up in it and we justify our behavior because it's how we were treated. Now, my dad was not eloquent with words, but he was gifted with hands. He could build anything. He could build houses. He could rebuild cars, but he didn't master conversation. And so this week, I decided, that's why I decided to do what I did. I thought, I want to publicly praise my children and honor them and thank them that I got to be their dad. Some of you are waiting on a phone call that will not come today. Some of you are waiting on a text that you will not see. And as a result of that, by about 10 o'clock tonight, you will have told yourself stories that are not true. My children don't love me. My children don't care. They don't respect me. And before long, you'll get angry without realizing some of your children have children of their own and they're just busy. They're broke. They haven't told you they have no money. They're suffering. They're struggling. It's not that they haven't thought about you. It's just there are about 10 things in front of you that they've had to think about to survive. Don't have a pity party. You get on the phone and call them and say, I just want you to know it's 10 o'clock. And don't, don't manipulate them. And, and, and don't do that. Just look, call and say, hey, I've been thinking about you all day. And i got to tell you, it has been an honor to be your father. Because that's really what God did to us. He said, I want all of you to know, all you fallen creatures, it is an honor to be your dad. See, guys, listen to me. We've been brought up to believe men don't cry. Men are tough. Men never show their emotions. And you will never have a great relationship with anybody starting with your spouse if you're that way. There are times when I'm talking to Susan or we're talking to somebody else. This happened just about a week ago. And I was talking to one of our daughters and I began to cry as I was telling her how much I loved her mother. And you say, that sounds sissified. I would have never done that 20 years ago. But what I've realized is that we've got to get beyond the shell of societal stereotypes that say men don't weep. Men don't talk that way. If you're a real man, you'll get down on your knees and you'll tell your wife, you'll tell your kids how awesome they are. Say, well, what, what if they're not awesome? 
I, I, I know what you're thinking, see. That's not, I, you're sitting going, well, they're not. They're stupid. They've been nothing but trouble their whole life. No, you're talking about how they're acting, not who they are. See, I, I'm not asking you to be a hypocrite and lie. They could be acting as stupid as stupid can be, but that's not really who they are. That's how they're acting. See, because they're creating the image and likeness of God. So when I tell you, you're telling them they're awesome, you're just agreeing with God. That's all you're doing. And you think you're telling yourself a lie, and I've talked to parents, I can't do that. They're just dumb. They'll get even dumber if I do that. No, they'll start becoming who you've called them because you're not addressing how they act. You're addressing who they are and who they were created to be. We were not taught that. So when they're being dumb, say, that's just not who you are. That's, I know that's not who you are. You're awesome. You're incredible. You're creating the image and likeness of God. Great things lie in you. Your destiny is incredible. They will make mistakes just like you do, just like you've done, just like you will do. And you're not condoning wrong behavior. You're introducing them to the right person. Fifthly, expect carefully. So what does that really mean? Well, here's the problem. Most of us are frustrated not because of what someone did, but because we ex- what we expected them to do that they didn't do. Unmet expectations create frustrations that change situations. And you and I have to be very careful not to expect. I, I, and I, trust me, I wanted my kids to do certain things, but I knew what I was under my whole life. My brother made straight A's. I like to make people laugh. <laughs> he couldn't do that. I was special. But because he made straight A's, my parents thought I should. I didn't really want to. I went to school because it was a social thing. Hey, let's hang out. I wanted to major in recess. (laughs) It's a lot more fun. I know you don't make money. I know that now. But I thought I could make money at recess. And I did sometimes. You know, I'd bet on races and I'd outrun somebody and pay up. Anyway, so what happens is we expect things that don't happen and that creates frustration which creates separation in the situation because we had an expectation that was not met. People will always let you down. They don't mean to. Not always like they will all the time. But what I'm saying is people will let you down. We will let each other down. And, and, you know, this is the reason people get mad. They expect somebody to be perfect. I was expected to be perfect. I've never been perfect. I never thought I was perfect. But that expectation caused a lot of people to be frustrated. You know what? I expect you to be you. I expect you to fall down, but I expect you to get up. If you don't get up, I'm going to come over and help you get up. Because I expect to have to do something to help in that. But what we do is we, we, when somebody doesn't do what we expect them to do, we have a tendency to get hurt, and we hurt punitively instead of redemptively. And we fail to talk respectfully. And we certainly don't ask the right questions purposefully. And as a result of that, it's very difficult to forgive daily. Because what makes forgiveness so difficult is when you start adding all the, the indiscretions in your mind. You start adding those up. And before you know it, you forget what you're supposed to do because you're too busy judging instead of forgiving. And your kids need to be forgiven. And children, your fathers need to be forgiven. And some of you were abused in many different ways, and that's not right. But you still have to find a way to forgive. It doesn't mean you have to be around that person. It doesn't mean you have to hang out with them. But you've got to forgive. So some of you say, I forgive you, and then you expect something in return. When I say expect carefully, be careful not to expect people to do the right thing because you did We've all been hurt. We've all had broken hearts because of expectations we couldn't live up to. My dad couldn't live up to my expectations. He didn't even know what they were. How could he possibly do it? But you know what? There was one person I could change, and that was me. There was only one person who could change my expectations, and that was me. And when I started giving to my father what I wanted from him, 
he began to give to me what I had wanted my whole life. Before he died, we had nothing between us but love. I was there on my knees at his bedside as he was dying, crying my eyes out because I had a great relationship with him, not because I had regrets, but because I loved him and I knew he loved me. We expect people to live longer than they might live. And we think, someday I'll get it right. Today is that someday. Today. If you know of anyone, especially a father or son, that there is a wall between you, make it right today. Lastly, review everything I've said frequently. Have I forgiven today? I don't do this every day now, but there was a day when I was very religious about getting up and saying, God, God, today I forgive ahead of time. Everybody's going to hurt me. Every dumb driver that's going to be on Oklahoma highways. (laughs) I forgive ahead of time, God. May their license be revoked. No, I don't do that. (laughs) Review frequently. Am I asking questions purposely? Or am I just flippantly having conversations with people? I remember when I was in college, one day this came to me. You pass people on the sidewalk, we're busy. How you doing? Everybody said, I'm great. Okay, good. Good to see you. Number one, you're lying. It wasn't good to see them. You don't really even like them, but it's the right thing to say. And I started thinking, what if somebody asked me one day, hey, 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 how you doing? Terrible. It, life is horrid right now. They wouldn't even have heard it because that's how we exist. Everything is surface in our society. We don't sit down long enough. When's the last time you sit down and had a conversation with one of your children? So really, how you doing? Everything going okay financially? Here's what we say. It's none of my business. Well, you know, it might be some of your business if you ask the right question. And you ask, I'm not, I'm not asking to get into your personal finances, but are you okay? Do you know what that would mean to somebody that you love, that you cared enough to ask a question that would require a moment, a feeling, a thought to respond to you. Your belief, your beliefs become your thoughts. Your thoughts become your words. Your words become your actions. Your actions become your habits. Your habits become your values. Your values become your destiny. There's a whole lot that leads up to who you'll become, who your children will become. And I don't say this boastfully at all. I say this only because I I wish it was different. There are no mulligans in life, dads. There are no do-overs. But I remember having raised five children, that one day I realized that I had done something very wrong to my oldest son. I expected things of him because he was my oldest. And he had a minor accident in his vehicle. He, on a wet street, didn't make enough plan to stop quick enough, bumped another car. It was $1,800 worth of damage. He was just 16, hadn't been driving long, and I remember looking at him and said, well, you're going to have to pay for that. And he did. Years later, not too long ago, I realized the Lord spoke to my heart. And he said, that that was not right. And I didn't just call and apologize. I wrote an $1,800 check and I mailed it to him and I said, I'm so sorry. I, you were my firstborn. I didn't know how to have a driver and here's your money back because I shouldn't have made you pay. It was an accident. You said, I was teaching this old baby boy. I was teaching him responsibility, bless God. <laughs> yeah, that's how we do it in the country. Yeah, you're an idiot. <laughs> I'm sure glad God didn't go, wait, you deserve that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd help you, but you brought it on yourself. Yeah, I'm God. I can do that. That's how a lot of parents think. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm your authority. I can do that. I can, I can be a jerk if I want to, but you can't. Come on, man. 
people make mistakes all the time. If you want grace and you want your kids to love you, you better sow grace and you better sow love. Well. I'm tired. Probably said some things some of you are mad about. I did see one lady walk out. I assume she didn't like much about what I said. It's all right. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and Red Bull. The quadrinity. Anyway, so some of you get mad at that, but it's a little late. I'm almost done, so you don't have to walk out. It's all right. Just walk out with everybody else and just go ahead and think what you want to think. It makes you look better, not me. I love you all so much, and I have so much fun. I hope you're okay with it. Uh, sometimes, you know, life's heavy. Being a father is heavy. Being an abused child is heavy. Being a neglected child is heavy. They're difficult. And the Bible says laughter is good medicine because I think sometimes we just need to look and go, it's going to be all right. God knew what was going to happen before it all happened. and All we got to do is look to him and say, God, I, I don't know why all this is happening, but I don't know why I had four or five flights canceled and everything was stupid. I, I just know this. I'm going to get to Oklahoma and I'm going to preach to my people. <laughs> and then when I come down from this high, I'm going to sleep until Jesus comes back. <laughs> we probably ought to pray. <laughs> So let's do that. God, thanks. We so desperately need you all the time, every moment of every day. God, we all make mistakes. We've all been wronged, and we're all wrong sometimes. So God, help us when we are to, um, to love anyway. Forgive every day. Ask purposefully. Talk respectfully. Hurt redemptively. Expect carefully and review all of these frequently so that, God, we can live a victorious, overcoming life. With every head bowed and every eye closed, there may be those of you who have never accepted Christ. You've never looked to our Heavenly Father, so it's very difficult to even possibly think about being a good earthly father. So I'm going to pray a simple prayer. I want to ask all of you who are in here to pray it with me, but I want those of you who have never called on the name of the Lord to pray this with incredible purpose. God's going to change your life today. You've been hurt for, hurting for a long time. You've been angry and bitter for a long time. You've been unforgiving for a long time. Your dad left. He was never there. Your son doesn't respect you, and he never has, and even to this day he doesn't. And you wake up every day or at least once a year and go, okay, He's going to do it this year. And you're waiting on something that God's waiting on you to do. So do it. But it begins with accepting Christ as your Savior. So pray this with me, everyone here, everyone watching online. Say, Father God, thank you so much for sending your only son to die on the cross for me. Jesus, thank you for giving your life for me. Today I give my life to you. I repent of my sin. Ask you to forgive me. I call on your name, and I declare today, I am a Christian. Amen. Okay, you can look up, those of you that prayed that. I want to ask you to text the word SAVED. Listen carefully, the most powerful text. And those of you watching online, text the word SAVED to 405-500-1310. 405-500-1310. Just text the word SAVED. be the most powerful text you've ever texted in your life. And do that right now this time, I want to receive our tithes and our offerings. I read this, this little brief thought. I don't even know why it jumped out on I me. Mean, I was doing some research, and it just jumped out because I think a lot of times we think, man, I got I to gotta be a go-getter. I got to get after it. We use those words. I, I got to get it done. And, the, and, and we do that, and we think, you know what? This is what this guy said. Getters are not the ones who get. Getters, go-getters are not the ones who get. Givers are the ones who get. 
You can chase a dream. You can chase money. You can chase whatever you want, success. You can chase popularity. You can chase all those things. And you know what? God help you when you get them if you haven't first given because you won't know what to do with what you got. The way we learn is to release and watch God gather and bring what he wants to bring. That's how come he said, if you give, it will be given back to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. God will get it to you. But if all you're after is to get something, you may get something, but it won't be what you want, or better yet, it won't be fulfilling because you made it happen. When you include God and involve God, then and only then will you find the satisfaction and fulfillment of getting what it is you wanted. So, I want to encourage you. I, 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 I did a funeral a month ago and, or so, and uh, it was a really dear friend of mine. I, I matter of fact, he was supposed to die some nine or ten years ago. He called me. Uh, I was his pastor then, and he said, I, I'm going to die. I've been diagnosed with cancer. And he said, I'm planning my funeral. He was a very diligent man, very principled in church all the time. And he said, I want you to do my funeral. Would you do that? I said, I sure will. And I said, tell me what you want me to say, and I'll say it. I said, I want to honor you. Well, we prayed. He said, well, you prayed maybe that, that I'd be healed. Well, we prayed. And I'm telling you, the cancer went away for nine years, eight or nine years. And he called me this last year. He said, Mark, I got, it came back. He said, I, here's my situation. It started getting really bad. And uh, so I, he asked me, will you do my funeral? I said, of course I'll do your funeral. And uh, I went to the house after he passed. This was about a month ago. And I sat down with his family and we began to talk about him and all the, these, these Bibles and everything. And I didn't know this, but what he had done was he had set up text to give automatic every week he gave. They were showing me every week. I can't see all that because so many people give here. I don't even see all of it. I know uh, people tell me. I have testimonies of people. But I don't sit around and look at all the givers. And what, But what moved me wasn't the amount that he gave. That wasn't what moved me. What moved me was he gave in the same way he served God and attended church. He was here almost every Sunday. Only giving was even better because even when he wasn't here, he gave. And I wept at his funeral, which I very rarely weep at funerals. They're a celebration typically to me. And not I don't mean to be disrespectful, but, but somebody like this guy, his life was so well lived. He loved God and he was in heaven. But I wept at that funeral as I spoke because of the impact his life had on my life. You know, I'm the pastor. Everybody says, well, you touched my life. I got to tell you, so many of you have touched my life. And I, I, I got to say this in, his, in the area of offering and giving, but and I, I, this is spontaneous, but I feel like I need to do it. And, and I would say two people that have touched my life, Larry and Francis Jones. And I want to ask you all to stand because honor is due you. Stand up, Larry and Francis. These people have given so much to the world. They have given their lives, their money, fed children all over the world, and you all are to be honored. When I don't see them, they have so deeply touched my life. They sit there every week. They were gone for a couple weeks. You guys can't ever be gone without me noticing. And I called them last week, and I said, are you okay? I've missed them. And Francis has been battling. I love you so much, Francis, and you are such a powerful lady. Fights through it, shows up for church in pain. Let me tell you all something. People who really connect with God have given everything to God. My friend Mike, Larry and Francis, so many of you that I don't even know have given so much to God. So when I talk about giving financially, it's not just about money. It's about a part of who we are, our Christianity, our life. So today, if you want to write a check, just write it to Mosaic. There's an offering envelope in the seat back in front of you if you want to give by cash. If you want to do like my friend Mike and give by text, you can do that by texting 405-546-2226. 405-546-2226. Just text the word give or tithe. And if you do that, you can set it up. He did it automatically, or you can give whenever you want, uh, as you will. And with all the storms and electricity and power outages we have, so many people give by text. It's awesome. Or you can give online, mosaicokc.church, okay? Let's just go ahead and pass the buckets. Those of you here for the first time, we have a gift for you at the Welcome Kiosk. And uh, it's uh, just a small gift, but you can take a part of Mosaic home with you. And prayerfully, you won't forget us. And prayerfully, you won't forget this day. 
And if you do remember it, hopefully it's with good feelings. Uh, and I, I love you. I love God. I love this church. I love my life. Love my wife. I love everything about what God is doing. I care deeply about you. I care deeply about your family and your future. And uh, I wouldn't be back here if I didn't. And I, I want the best for you. And my prayer is that you would continue uh, throughout this week to hear the heartbeat of God in your life and, and your family. And I do thank you for all you do. I do apologize. I've gone about 10 minutes over uh, what I normally would. I, I am very tired. Three hours sleep and three and a half hours sleep, about 36 hours. I, 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 but I just had to be here. It's Father's Day. And I thought, I told Susan, I said, I'm going straight to the church. I did have a shower, so you can't hug me in the lobby. But my hair, I didn't, ha I didn't have hair product this morning. <laughs> Not like I need much. <laughs> but I'm wearing the hat to protect you. And hopefully you understand. Okay, well, let's stand to our feet. We're going to go out with a shout of hallelujah on three. One, two, three. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.